Good evening. I'm Edwin Newman, moderator of this first debate of the 1976 campaign between Gerald R. Ford of Michigan, Republican candidate for president, and Jimmy Carter of Georgia, Democratic candidate for president. We thank you, President Ford, and we thank you, Governor Carter, for being with us tonight. There are to be three debates between the presidential candidates and one between the vice presidential candidates. All are being arranged by the League of Women Voters Education Fund. Tonight's debate, the first between presidential candidates in 16 years and the first ever in which an incumbent president has participated, is taking place before an audience in the Walnut Street Theater in Philadelphia, just three blocks from Independence Hall. The television audience may reach 100 million in the United States and many millions overseas. Tonight's debate focuses on domestic issues and economic policy. Questions will be put by Frank Reynolds of ABC News, James Gannon of the Wall Street Journal, and Elizabeth Drew of the New Yorker magazine. Under the agreed rules, the first question will go to Governor Carter. That was decided by the toss of a coin. He will have up to three minutes to answer. One follow-up question will be permitted with up to two minutes to reply. President Ford will then have two minutes to respond. The next question will go to President Ford with the same time arrangements, and questions will continue to be alternated between the candidates. Each man will make a three-minute statement at the end, Governor Carter, to go first. President Ford and Governor Carter do not have any notes or prepared remarks with them this evening. Mr. Reynolds, your question for Governor Carter. Mr. President, Governor Carter, Governor, in an interview with the Associated Press last week, you said you believe these debates would alleviate a lot of concern that some voters have about you. Well, one of those concerns, not an uncommon one about uh, candidates in any year, is that many voters say they don't really know where you stand. Now, you have made jobs your number one priority, and you have said you are committed to a drastic reduction in unemployment. Can you say now, Governor, in specific terms, what your first step would be next January, if you are elected, to achieve that. Yes. First of all is to recognize the tremendous economic strength of this country and to set the putting to back to work of our people as a top priority. This is uh, an effort that ought to be done primarily by strong leadership in the White House, the inspiration of our people, the tapping of uh, business, agriculture, industry, labor, and government at all levels to work on this uh, project. We'll never have a, an end to the inflationary spiral, and we'll never have a balanced budget until we get our people back to work. There's several things that can be done specifically that are not now being done. First of all, to channel research and development funds into areas that will provide uh, large numbers of jobs. Secondly, we need to have a commitment in the uh, private sector uh, to cooperate with government in matters like housing. They have a very small investment of taxpayers money in the housing field can bring large numbers of extra jobs in the guarantee of mortgage loans and the uh, putting forward of uh, 202 programs for housing for older people and so forth to cut down the roughly 20 percent unemployment that now exists in the, in the construction industry. Another thing is to deal with our uh, needs in the central cities where the unemployment rate is extremely high sometimes among minority groups uh, those who don't speak English or who are black uh, young people of 40% unemployment. Here, a CCC-type program would be appropriate to channel money into the, uh, in, into the sharing with private sector and also local and state governments to employ young people who are now out of work. Another very important uh, aspect of our uh, economy would be to increase production in every way possible, uh, to hold down uh, taxes on individuals, and to uh, shift the tax burdens onto those who have avoided paying taxes in the past. These uh, kinds of specific things, uh, none of which are being done now, would be a great help in, in reducing uh, unemployment. There is uh, an additional factor that needs to be done and covered very, very succinctly, and that is to make sure that we have a good relationship between management, business on the one hand, and labor on the other. In a lot of uh, places, where uh, unemployment is very high, we might channel specific uh, targeted job, in, job uh, opportunities by paying part of the salary of unemployed people uh, and also sharing with uh, local governments the payment of salaries, which would uh, let us cut down the unemployment rate much lower 
before we hit the inflationary level, but I believe that by the end of the first four years of, uh, of the next term, we could have the unemployment rate down to 3% adult unemployment, which is about uh, 4 to 4.5% overall, uh, controlled inflation rate, and have a, a balance of growth of about uh, 4 to 6%, around 5%, which would give us a balanced budget. Governor, uh, in the event you are successful and you do achieve a drastic drop yes. in unemployment that is likely to create additional pressure on prices, how willing are you to consider an incomes policy? In other words, wage and price controls. Well, we now have such a, a low utilization of uh, our productive capacity, uh, about 73%, I think it's about the lowest since the Great Depression is, and such a high unemployment right now, 7.9%, uh, that uh, we have a long way to go in getting people to work before we have the inflationary pressures. And I think this would, uh, would be uh, easy to accomplish, to get jobs down without having the strong inflationary pressures that, that would be necessary. I would not favor the uh, payment of, uh, of a given fixed income to people unless they are not able to work. But with tax incentives for the low-income groups, we can build up their uh, income levels uh, above the poverty level and not uh, make welfare more uh, profitable than, than work. Mr. President, your response? I don't believe that uh, Mr. Carter has been any more specific in this case than he has been on many other instances. I noticed particularly that he didn't endorse the Humphrey Hawkins bill, which he has on occasions, and which is included as a part of the Democratic platform. That legislation uh, allegedly would help our unemployment, but uh, we all know that it would have controlled our economy. It would have added uh, 10 to 30 billion dollars each year in additional expenditures by the federal government. It would have called for export controls on agricultural products. In my judgment, the best way to get jobs is to uh, expand the private sector. We're Five out of six jobs today exist in our economy. We can do that by reducing federal taxes, as I proposed uh, about a year ago when I called for a tax reduction of $28 billion. Three quarters of it to go to private uh, taxpayers and uh, one quarter to the business sector. We could add to jobs in the major metropolitan areas by a proposal that I recommended that would give tax incentives to business, to move into the inner city, and to expand or to build new plants so that they would take a plant or expand a plant where people are and people are currently unemployed. We could uh, also uh, help our youth with some of the proposals that uh, would give to young people an opportunity to work and learn at the same time, just like we give money to young people who are going to college. Those are the kind of specifics that I think we have to discuss on these uh, debates. And these are the kind of programs that I'll talk about on my time. Mr. Gannon, your question to President Ford. Mr. President, I would like to continue for a moment on this uh, question of taxes, which you've just raised. You have said that you favor more tax cuts for middle-income Americans, even those earning up to $30,000 a year. That presumably would cost the Treasury quite a bit of money in lost revenue. In view of the very large budget deficits that you have accumulated and that are still in prospect, how is it possible to promise further tax cuts and to reach your goal of balancing the budget? At the time, Mr. Gannon, that I made the recommendation for a $28 billion tax cut, three quarters of it to go to individual taxpayers and 25% to American business, I said at the same time that we had to hold a lid on federal spending, that for every dollar of a tax reduction, we had to have an equal reduction in federal expenditures, a one-for-one -one proposition. And I recommended that to the Congress with a budget ceiling of $395 billion, and that would have permitted us to have a $28 billion tax reduction. In my tax reduction program for middle-income taxpayers, 
I recommended that the Congress increase personal exemptions from $750 per person to $1,000 per person. That would mean, of course, that for a family of four, that that family would have a thousand dollars more personal exemption, money that they could spend for their own purposes, money that the government wouldn't have to spend. But if we keep the lid on federal spending, which I think we can with the help of the Congress, we can justify fully a $28 billion tax reduction. In the budget that I submitted to the Congress in January of this year, I recommended a 50% cutback in the rate of growth of federal spending. For the last 10 years, the budget of the United States has grown from uh, about 11% per year. We can't afford that kind of growth in federal spending. And in the budget that I recommended, we cut it in half a growth rate of five to five and a half percent. With that kind of limitation on federal spending, we can fully justify the tax reductions that I have proposed. And it seems to me with the stimulant of more money in the hands of the taxpayer and with more money in the hands of business to expand, to modernize, to provide more jobs, our economy will be stimulated so that we'll get more revenue and we'll have a more prosperous economy. Mr. President, to follow up a moment, uh, the Congress has passed a tax bill, which is before you now, which did not meet exactly the uh, sort of outline that you requested. What is your intention on that bill, uh, since it doesn't meet your, your requirements? Do you plan to sign that bill? That tax bill does not entirely meet the criteria that I established. I think the Congress should have uh, added another $10 billion reduction in personal income taxes, including the increase of personal exemptions from $750 to $1,000. And Congress could have done that if the budget committees of the Congress and the Congress as a whole had not increased the spending that I recommended in the budget. I'm sure you know that in the resolutions passed by the Congress, they have added about $17 billion in more spending by the Congress over the budget that I recommended. So I would prefer in that tax bill to have an additional tax cut and a further limitation on federal spending. Now this tax bill that hasn't reached the White House yet, but is expected in a day or two. It's about 1,500 pages. It has some good provisions in it. It has uh, left out some that I have recommended, unfortunately. On the other hand, uh, when you have a bill of that magnitude, with th those many provisions, a president has to sit and decide if there's more good than bad. And from the analysis that I've made so far, it seems to me that that tax bill does uh, justify my signature and my approval. Governor Carter, your response? Well, Mr. Ford is, is changing uh, considerably his previous philosophy. The present tax structure is a disgrace to this country. It's just a welfare program for the rich. As a matter of fact, 25% uh, of the total tax deductions go for only 1% of the richest people in this country. And over 50% of the tax or credits go for the 14% of the richest people in this country. When Mr. Ford first became president in August of 1974, the first thing he did in October was to ask for a $4.7 billion increase in taxes on our people in the midst of the heaviest recession since, uh, since the Great Depression of, 19, uh, of the 1940s. In uh, January of 1975, he asked for a tax change a $5.6 billion increase on low- and middle-income private individuals, a $6.5 billion decrease on the corporations and the special interests. In uh, December of uh, 1975, he vetoed the roughly 18 to $20 billion uh, tax reduction bill that had been passed by the Congress. And then he came back later on in January of this year, and he did advocate a $10 billion tax reduction, but it would be offset by a $6 billion increase this coming January in deductions for Social Security payments and for unemployment compensation. The whole philosophy of the Republican Party, including uh, my opponent, has been to pile on taxes 
Well, low income people have taken off on the corporations. As a matter of fact, in, since, since the late 60s, when Mr. Nixon took office, we've had a reduction in, uh, in the percentage of taxes paid by corporations from 30% down to about 20%. We've had an increase in taxes paid by individuals, payroll taxes, from 14% up to 20%. And this is what the Republicans have done to us. And this is why tax reform is so important. This is Drew, your question to Governor Carter. Uh, Governor Carter, you proposed a number of new or enlarged programs, including jobs, health, welfare reform, child care, aid to education, aid to cities, changes in social security, and housing subsidies. You've also said that you want to balance the budget by the end of your first term. Now, you haven't put a price tag on those programs, but even if we price them conservatively, and we count for full employment by the end of your first term, and we count for the economic growth that would occur during that period, there still isn't a...